I am passionately against what everybody thinks today is that the internet and that Amazon is destroying retail. And there's a false narrative that's out there that says, oh my gosh, Amazon's putting everybody out of business and no one's gonna go to retail stores anymore. And they've been saying it so long that everybody believes it. Let's jump in. Today, we're talking to Dave Cheatham. Dave's in Phoenix. He's the president of Velocity Retail Group, which is focused on retail services and construction for a wide variety of retail organizations like Hobby Lobby, Lowe's, Gap, Academy, Olive Garden, Cricket Mobile, and many others. Dave, first of all, thanks for being here. Really appreciate your time today. Oh, I'm glad to, glad to participate. That's great. In our, in our brief time together, I've realized that Dave is all about the importance of uh, fundamentals, and I thought I would start there. So from your role of oversight, I wanted to know how you see the role of fundamentals with velocity in particular. Well, we're in a service industry. So when you're in a service industry, uh, you know, I think that the fundamentals kind of cross all kinds of, you know, how to keep the customer and the client happy. And when you do that, it goes back to the fundamentals of being responsible about communication. And one of the biggest things that is kind of the, the foundation for what we're doing is keeping your promise. Because mm. so much of the time, what we realize is that you have this unrealized expectations when people break their promise. And that usually creates upset. And in many cases, it creates all kinds of drama when people don't do what they say they're going to do. When you're in the sales in industry and you're in the service industry, it all comes down to, are we keeping our promises so that we can meet or exceed the expectation of your clients? And the biggest thing for us is this thing called keeping your promise. Are you going to do what you said you're going to do on the time frame that you said you're going to do it? And if you don't, did you go back to the person and we use the word revoke your promise and go, hey, I can't meet what I told you I'm going to do, but I can do it at this time frame. Because the, the biggest part of, you know, upset is created when somebody ends up, you've told them you're going to do something and you don't do it. But if I come back to you and say, hey, I told you I was going to do this by five and I'm not going to meet that time frame, but I'll have it for you by nine o'clock in the morning, 99% of the time, the person's okay. The upset comes when five comes and you're sitting there going, wait a minute, I never heard from this guy. So that's one of the things that we teach and preach, you know, in our team. Matter of fact, we're having a training session today. It's totally focused on making sure everybody's clear through the process that they do this. And then the second part of that question too, is how are you, you mentioned that having the integrity to come back to them and saying when things don't go as expected, making sure that that's communicated effectively. How are you tracking um, those promises that you do make, the commitments that you make to your customers, how are you tracking those and making sure that you do have um, the commitment moving forward? Yeah, well, our, you know, about 20 years ago when we formed kind of our team with, a, you know, 10 people on the team earlier on in the business, you know, we really had two things that were the focus of our organization. One is strength-based teaming. And what does that mean? That means that we pick you know, everybody that's on a team is much like a sports team. We don't have five centers and three point guards. We have people that are, are focused on their strength. They get to do what they like to do. And then the second part of it and what they're strong at, the second part of it is we use technology as an accelerator. So what that means is, you know, technology is what always separates and is what always gives somebody a competitive advantage all through history. Um, as we've moved into, hey, you know, as, as things change. So we started a few years ago uh, using a, a software program uh, called Command Hound, and it's an accountability software program. So when uh, a person, if I create a, you know, a request for someone, it actually is, is you know, put in, into a database. It says, you know, under their name, which they see and they're emailed. And it says, hey, will you do this for me? They have a right to say no or counter because you've got to give them the right to say no or counter. Otherwise, you know, you're just piling stuff on a list and th how do they know they can keep their promise? They've never committed, they've never made a promise to you, you're just throwing stuff on their list. Once they accept it, then the computer, there's a time frame, there's a default time and, and the database gives you a score. When it gets real close to the deal, the database turns to a yellow light and if they break the promise, it turns to red. 
And mm -hmm. um, so you can put somebody else that manages it. You can manage it yourself. The requester can manage it. So it's a very, very uh, sophisticated way of, you know, saying I got 48 things on a to-do list that 10 people are doing and it tracks, you know, who's keeping their promise, who's not keeping their promise. Not just about, oh my gosh, you know, you had a miss here, but really to make sure things don't fall through the cracks. That's really cool. That sounds a lot like, um, are you familiar with John Doerr? Is that name familiar to you? No, it's not. So, so he, he wrote a book a few years ago called Measure What Matters. And it was all about what expectations oh, yeah. are going to have within a certain framework of time. Your framework for that sounds really similar to that, which, and he was used in the original um, Google setup. I'm sure you found it to be very, very helpful. Well, and my business partner always says what it does is eliminate this thing called did you. And um, did you means, hey, did you ever follow up with that guy and send him what we said? Did you, you know, mm -hmm. send that copy out that we were supposed to send out? Did you? We don't want did you's. We want to make a request. Somebody accepts a request. If they can't do the request, then they come back to you and said, hey, can I change the date on this before it's due? Mm -hmm. And and so, yeah, we, we one of my favorite books is a, a book called Getting Things Done. And and it really lays out the difference of somebody putting something on a list and somebody making a promise on a to-do. And people get confused. They make a list, but a list is not a promise to yourself to do anything. It's just a list. So they go through this big list. What, what the book of Getting Things Done is focused on is like, yeah, take all of the stuff that you have and put it on a list. And, that's, and, and now get rid of all the paper and all the junk and all the stuff on your desk. And you now have a list of all these things you have to do. But the promise comes when you read the list and say, today, I'm going to promise myself to do these 10 things on a list with maybe 100 things. You don't read through the 100 things every day, which is what most people do. Mm -hmm. And then it's overwhelming and it takes too much time. But you go, oh, I'm going to create myself a to-do list, which is really a promise to yourself. And then if you have other team members and you're making a request to someone else, then they, you might say, hey, uh, Sally, will you put this on your, you know, I, here's my request for you. Will you do this for me? It's now on their to-do list and they're going to make a promise to you to do it. And then, then in that case, it always comes down to like your point, you need an X by Y. I'm going to do X by Y date. And that's the promise. We use technology to measure those promises. So when Y comes and X isn't done, you go, oh, we got a problem. And what it does is it, it frees up your mind because the, the database is telling you, because we all know like the more things you give out to people that you're like, oh, I wonder if that got done. Did that? No one ever told me about that. Mm. I wonder if that got done. So it, it's, a, it's a freeing process. And that's one of the things that getting things done is take it out of your brain and put it onto a computer or onto a piece of paper or onto an iPad or onto a mobile device. I can see how helpful that would be. Going back to the leadership perspective, as a believer in Jesus Christ, how has that influenced how you lead maybe differently than somebody else in a similar position than you? Well, I mean, I think one of the things that uh, is a big differentiator is trying to, trying to come from the perspective of the same person on Sunday, on Monday, um, and, and applying the things and, and living out your faith, you know, in how you're doing business. It's very easy. It's easy for me. And there's been times, many times I've done it where you fall into the deal where you're just focused like on the deal and, and getting it done and you kind of lose your perspective mm -hmm. because we're focused mana, 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 waking up and, and, and driving for our business. But it's a reminder of like, Hey, are, am I applying these principles and how I'm leading? Am I applying these principles, how management things are done? Am I applying these principles on helping people get to their goals, not just me getting and my partner getting to our goals is like where everybody gets to their goals. That's probably one of the, you know, the biggest points. Mm -hmm. That's great. And then having been in this industry for several decades now, um, maybe you're making you could... me sound very old. <laughs> What's a commonly held belief. Do you think about retail real estate that you would passionately disagree with if any uh whether it deals in particular with real estate or or whether it deals with retail well if i took the part of the question where you talk about what is the description of what's going on in the retail real estate industry what everybody thinks today is that the internet and that amazon is destroying retail and i matter of fact i was i just sent somebody an email this morning to show there's an article i read this morning on best buy and there's a false narrative that's out there 
that says, oh my gosh, Amazon's putting everybody out of business and no one's going to go to retail stores anymore. And they've been saying it so long that everybody believes it. I got people like, hey, what are you going to do in this business? Because wow, the business has changed. They're not going to be shopping centers anymore. And you're like, well, that is not true. Number one, the favorite thing that everybody does, the number one thing everybody does on vacation is retail. <laughs> I don't care where you go. Mama's going to the store. Someone's going to the store. They're going to the outlet mall. It's it's. And when you look at it, you go, wow, would you believe that more people go to the Mall of America, the largest mall in the world, than go to Disneyland or Disney World every week? Wow. That's how big, that's how big shopping is. So what they don't understand is retail is always changing. It's a constant shift and evolution. And a lot of people think there's a big revolution. It's really an evolution. We used to roll from the, the, the smaller shopping centers that were food and drugs. Then we moved into the power center stage in the 90s and the big box tenants. And then we, we had Walmart come in and, oh, they're going to kill all the small towns. And, and then you've rolled into you know Amazon and then everybody's like, oh, Amazon, Amazon, Amazon. And, and now like the, the article today, it was so powerful is Amazon is opening stores all over America. People that are, people are learning that it isn't the internet and it, it's not online and bricks and mortars, which we all were always for the last 10 years, they said bricks versus clicks. And it's like, oh, but what they're realizing is that bricks are more efficient because think about it. You want to order something on Amazon. They got to get one product and put it in a truck and drive it to your house, or you can just go somewhere and get it. And so what they're learning is Amazon's like, we need to have a distribution center that's more in the neighborhoods. Mm. So one of the things that Best Buy was talking about today, Best Buy grew during 2020, they grew their online business 90%. So they grew almost doubled their night, almost doubled their online business. But of that, a huge majority of that people came to the store to pick it up. So now they're redesigning their stores They're closing some stores and they're redesigning their stores because what the most profitable way for a store is for someone to order it online, come to the store and pick it up mainly because they call it BOPUS. But when you go to the store, people go and they, if they don't want to go inside, you know, like in, you could just meet in the parking lot or you can go in and pick it up. So they're redesigning these stores. So BOPUS is the most profitable because when they go back to the store, they go in and buy something else. Mm. So they can have, you've got to be able to deliver both. So you want to be able to have the online experience, but you also need to have a good store experience. And so these retailers that are going to do the best are the ones that are going, hey, you want yours delivered to your door. Somebody else wants to save money and, and just have it pick it up at the store when it's delivered. And somebody else wants to go in and have a shopping experience. Well, do you think that the uh, do you think that that will provide more opportunity for lost leaders? Uh, do you think that there's going to be more sort of in in store, in location, on location traffic? because of one particular draw that would lead to maybe a set of ancillary businesses, whether it's services or products in particular? Oh, totally. Totally. Let me give you an example. Like, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but you order something from Amazon. I ordered something and I put the wrong address in. I meant it for, for my daughter and it came to my office and it's like, wow, if I tried to ship this, it cost me 50 bucks. And so, and I can just put the label on it and ship it, but it was big. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to go into my neighborhood Kohl's and they very smartly put their return for Amazon in the back of their store. So you got to walk all the way through their <laughs> store past all their product. And then it was very quick. They took the product back, they handled it on the computer and I'm done. But what did they do before I left? They handed me a 35% discount coupon that works for that day. That if I go and buy anything in the store, I save 35%. Well, they were smart enough to go, we'll partner with your returns. And they got me to go to a coal store. They didn't have to run an ad for millions of dollars. They're just shipping the stuff. And I'm sure Amazon's paying them. And then they got a customer sitting in their store. And then they're giving me a discount, encouraging me to buy something in the store. That's clever. Yeah. I'm sure that in days to come, we're going to see more and more of that sort of partnership, considering how the technology change influences behavior and how there's a taking advantage of that. Super interested to know how that's going to play out in years to come. Let me ask you this too. Say you've dealt with an unexpected failure in the past. Can you talk about how the Holy Spirit gave you wisdom? Yeah, I, you know, it's funny because in your life, as you go through life, when I first got out of college, we were in a recession. I literally had been encouraged my whole life, like, hey, you're going to be successful. You have the characteristics, whatever. And I remember at the time wondering, like, there was no jobs. 
And, and I was like, man, am I going to be a failure? Am I, I got this degree, I got all this energy and whatever. Am I going to be able to get a job? That's the first time I ever questioned, am I going to be successful or am I going to be failure? Well, eventually I got hired in commercial real estate, you know, nine months later and started the industry. And then I, I pretty much had success from the very beginning. And so I went all through the nineties, all through the first part of the two thousands. And I have all this self-confidence and things, things are great. And I'm thinking I'm pretty good. And then all of a sudden that recession came in 2008, 2009, and our industry shut down. And I remember talking to my wife one day and she goes, what are you doing? I go, honey, I, I don't really have anything to do. I mean, we, there is nothing going on. And that was the first time that I thought, oh my gosh, I think I'm in business. I could really fail here. Hmm. And that's when I realized that, you know, it takes something like a sickness or a death where you're sitting here going, is this the 30s, 1930? you know, crash all over again. And it took something like that to realize like, Hey Dave, uh, I'm the one that's been doing this for you. And I know you're kind of in there high fiving yourself and you're taking all the credit. And that was the first time I realized like, wow, how arrogant, uh, you think you're doing all this. And I realized I wasn't doing all this. Wow. And, and, and that was kind of the breakthrough for me. And that was really a changing point for me because, and I'm not saying I don't, you know, I'm not human and I don't sit there and go, wow, that was amazing and high fiving and pat myself on the back. But I, I, but it, it, it's always the Holy Spirit's in the back are going, Hey, knucklehead, uh, remember the guy who, who's in control of whether you prosper or you go through hard times, you can't control sickness. You can't control a national economy. You can't control a global pandemic. These are the things that God's in control of. And that's where I learned like, Hey, dummy, and I knew it intellectually that I wasn't in control, but that's when I realized, realized like, hey, you better give the glory to the guy that deserves the glory. And so often, you know, we take his glory. And I think that's probably the biggest thing that, that, that I learned during that recession, the Great Recession. Wow. How do you see COVID as an accelerator or a changer of what has been in the industry? And how do you see that as something that you can take advantage of in your space? Yeah. From a retail perspective, you're seeing unbelievable acceleration and creativity by these retailers to figure out like, we're not going to die. We're going to adapt and we're going to pivot. And some of these things that they're doing, like if you look at, for example, the restaurants that are really prospered, and it depends on what kind of state you're in on, on how aggressive they are. But some of these states, if you took California's and, and New Mexico's and and New York and some of them where they just shut down restaurants and, and you have to eat outside or you couldn't eat there at all. Um all of a sudden these guys are like, we don't have a patio. Well, they're out in the parking lot, setting up tents and, <laughs> and driving the patio business. Some of my clients are des redesigning kitchens that are going, well, this product's too complicated and, and, and we don't really have a good way of, you know, ordering for takeout. So the delivery, when I raised my kids, the only thing you ate was pizza or Chinese food. Today you can get in, you can, you want to go to Fleming's and get a steak. No problem. You can get whatever you want. And these, these retailers are really learning like, you know, if we can't get them in the store, how do we get them in the parking lot? If you're a restaurant, we can't get them in the store. How do we get them on a patio? If you're a drive through restaurant, they're like, hmm, our drive through now, we don't have a dining room open. So all of a sudden now you'll see all of these workers out in the, uh, you know, in the parking lot with iPads taking orders to push them through. You know, it's like if you look at a Chick-fil-A, I mean, it's like a orchestrated, you know, program where they're just running, you know, hundreds and hundreds of cars through. But these, many of these things are going to create permanent change as they've learned to, to, to rebuild their menus, rebuild, you know, you know, now everybody's like, we want a double drive through. We want to, we want a pickup window, uh, mobile devices. Uh, today I went to Starbucks. My kids taught me, you know, like, no, we, I thought the thing fastest way was the drive through. They're like, nope, use the mobile device, use the app, order the deal, swing around front, run in, run out. And you've already paid for it. You have no drama. It's your same order. Um, so these are the changes that are going to last for, for a long time. Dave, I've really appreciated our, our time today. We've talked about a number of different, very helpful things. We've talked about how in your, uh, especially in your organization, integrity first and foremost, making sure that, that uh, the accountability is in place, making sure that those expectations that are communicated when things don't go as expected, that those are communicated to your team as well as to the client, making sure that everybody's on the same page because the upset comes when you don't communicate. And then talking about the explanation and the, the help in how strength-based teaming can be 
um, one of the ways that you can accelerate yourself to greater levels of, of uh, results. And then pair that with the use of technology to hold a team accountable for the, for the better results that come that way. Uh, your insights into the future of retail, that locational retail is something that's not going to change. It's going to remain the same. And how you talked about the recession, that the Holy Spirit can show an abundance of new things like pride and how your faith increased, knowing that God is sovereign over all things. And then you're talking about acceleration and the ability to remain creative and adapting to major changes. And of course, the importance of remaining flexible in these new permanent changes. Well, thanks for joining. Glad to participate.